Welcome to my kitchen. When Marnie Was There is a Studio Ghibli movie where the protagonist falls asleep a concerning amount of times. Anna is a depressed 12 year old who draws and has an abundant support system around her, but she can't seem to get her shit together and shake a feeling of emptiness inside her. Her teachers reach out to her, her classmates are really kind and like bring her her stuff when she forgets it, but she ignores all this and she focuses instead on this blank feeling inside her. Her parents decide to send her out on a vacation over the summer outside of the city with some relatives, thinking that maybe a change of scenery will give her the space to figure herself out. They she meets even more kind people, but she can't stop spiraling and self-destructing until one night she meets a girl in a magical mansion in this dreamy, interesting little adventure. As their relationship becomes very close, Anna finds herself opening up slowly to new friends until by the end of the movie, she's in a better space. So I was watching this movie with friend over Zoom during the pandemic and I was really taken with the artwork, which was gorgeous as expected and the depiction of depression I thought was spot on and it has the kind of magic and mundane feel that all the other Ghibli movies have and then at some point we were like this is gay isn't it marnie and anna are gay look at my fucking gay little babies they're in love and i love that you're my secret but they're not because marnie is anna's time traveling grandma who uses queer baiting to cure her gay orphan depression we will get to the queer stuff later on but first of all can you believe anna's gay orphan depression part one anna's gay orphan depression everyone is nice to anna for the whole movie and she's an absolute bitch about it she borders on being a deeply unlikable protagonist her parents love her her classmates all look out for her she's 12 and she's gay and she's my daughter look at her hair she draws turtleneck gay but honestly I feel unironically personally attacked by the depiction of depression in this movie. What people say about Anna in this movie is so akin to what motherfuckers said about me when I was like 13 and it all started hitting that I, it makes me angry on an irrational level. I wish I could go back to that time and clock all the support that was coming from me at all angles that I wasn't capable of receiving, but instead I made my teachers worried and I hurt my mommy's feelings. Now the cause of that is mental illness as it is with Anna, but it's still her responsibility. She still does it. You would think that being loved and flattered and given a lot of chances would be the kind of thing to make you feel good. You'd think that's the thing that people want, but I think a feeling that humanity values more than just feeling good is feeling seen. This movie is not kind to its protagonist. It shows something ugly and real. A self-pitying, unkind, and willful psyche. Depression is a disease that makes you want to kill yourself. Try it today. Side effects include being an asshole to people for absolutely no reason. A non-stop sensation of sadness deep down inside of you. Losing interest in things that once brought you joy. Feeling like no one understands you. Being deaf to all compliments and hyperfixating on anything anyone says says that validates that deep black pit of self-hate inside your heart. Making a YouTube channel. I have borderline personality disorder, which isn't depression, but has symptoms that are like depression. I take mirtazapine for it, 15 milligrams a day. I'm off my medication right now. Co comment if you think I should go back on my medication. You can't put me back on, I can see everything now. I appreciate the manifestation of depression in this film because it puts emphasis on the fact that there's no practical reason to feel this way right now. It's a nagging sensation, amorphous and corrosive that's gonna take a lot of time and work to undo. She doesn't really solve any problems throughout this movie. She just grapples with herself while everyone around her is really nice. And they are really nice. It's not that she's quiet. Just loud. In fact, what's demonstrated in the film is not only a very accurate portrayal of depression, but also how to treat it. Anna's a little too young to be hopping on medication, and anyways, medication is only about 20 to 30% of treating an illness that's really serious. The 70% is actually skill building and support network. This video is now like every other aspect of my life where I just repeat stuff that my therapist said to me and act like it's conversation. The people in Anna's life reach out to her. They don't blame her for her failings. They don't force her to be more social than she wants to be. They allow her to seek out things that interest and excite her. They encourage her when she exhibits healthier behavior. They defend her even when she fails. They laugh and joke even in the face of stress and struggle. But this disease will have you choosing to be sad when you have the option not to. It'll give you a dysmorphic understanding of what you are and who the people are that love you. Depression will have you focus on everything except for what's relevant. Hey, it's beautiful, isn't it? I bet you wish your auntie could come up here and see it. What is that up on the hill? I love the introductory sequence. Anna's sitting away from the kids that are playing on the playground. They're all laughing and having fun, but her head is down and focused in her only solace, her sad, gay little drawings. But it doesn't really matter. The teacher notices her and is presumably worried about her, so he approaches her and he asks to see her drawings. It's a simple gesture, but what it really is is it's expressing an interest for Anna's inner world. And Anna is on the brink of sharing that, and she, look, you see the hesitation in her and she gets nervous about it, but she's going to do it until the teacher is distracted by a physical emergency in the form of a little toddler falling on hitting his face on the ground or whatever. Oh, what's going on? Anna's art is important, but there's a health and safety issue right now, which is time sensitive. I gotta go take care of that. But depression does what it does 
does best and morphs this into a personal attack. And Anna pities herself so hard she has an asthma attack. I hate myself. <laughs> Now this pathological filtering out of everything positive raining down upon Anna from every angle eventually leads her to a dark place. One of the biggest plot points is when Anna calls a kind little girl a fat pig. Anna's eyes, they're sort of blue. It's actually really pretty. Almost Leave me like alone a already, oh, you fat pig. Part two, conflict and narrative. Conflict drives narrative. Nobody's gonna argue with that. Conflict between characters, conflict between factions and ideologies, conflict between people and forces of nature. This is what stories are made of. Conflict is motion, a world without conflict is a world static and dead. In stories, momentum and progression are everything, so often you'll hear people say, conflict is story. This is a good theory, but what about storytelling without conflict? The most interesting thing about the fat phobic depressed gay orphan attack of 2014, in my opinion, is not the conflict. Anna, for like the 90th time, is being offered friendship by a girl in her town who notices that she's kind of lagging behind. And Anna's general tactic throughout the movie up to this point has been just ignoring everything positive or just like saying petty, innocuous, whiny things. This was my daughter's room. Have you ever tried yoga? Oh, the closet and shelves are empty, so feel free to use them. Oh, how how nice! Postcards in this day and age. All right then, see you. Smells like someone else's home. The great sin this girl commits to provoke the attack is pursuing Anna a little too fervently and a little too on her level. So Anna snaps and does something mean. If you got mental illness, tell me if you recognize this one. I don't deserve love. I'm a bad person. I need to be punished. I need to be seen for what I am. The pain inside me needs to be revealed. Stop being nice to me. Stop treating me like I'm normal. I know you see how awful I am. I know you know. Stop acting like you don't know. Stop lying to me. I am wrong. I'm sick of everyone treating me like I'm not. Get away from me, you fat pig. Anna creates the reality she thinks she deserves. She does damage to a kind person to validate her presupposed belief of being a bad person. I look inside of myself and I see a bad person that isn't deserving of love. It's uncomfortable to receive things that you don't deserve sometimes. It's uncomfortable to not be seen. So in a panic, she seeks to release this tension finally. And good job, asshole, you succeeded. This is a pathological phenomenon, but it's unfortunately familiar to a lot of us. So look, now we have conflict. Perhaps now Anna will have to work throughout the movie in order to set this right. Or. Perhaps this little girl, like everyone else in this universe, except for Anna, is a complete angel and just offers to forget about it on the spot. Hey, what do you say we just drop it? And you could come out with us next week. <laughs> She's that nice. Rue the day that this child's kindness is lost on us and pray that we all are able to return to the state and the afterlife. She doesn't roll over and forgive. She offers to forget, sometimes the best way to end an argument when it gets a little too messy. She stands up for herself first and she chews out Anna for how mean that was and how mean she's been. But after that, she seems to re-recognize that she's a sad kid and she's probably doing this because she's sad and she's been isolated and she's ultimately more worried about her than her feelings are hurt. I understand it's hard for you right now, Here's another shot. And I know that conflict reveals character, but doesn't this also reveal character? People being kind to one another is an underrated narrative technique that can reveal a great deal about the giver and receiver of love. Studio Ghibli movies use this to great success a lot. And Anna can't fucking take it because she has already latched so hard onto that little window that she created for herself where she was getting deservedly told off, which leads her to run tearfully to the sea and our butch protagonist finally meets her femme counterpart, Marnie. And oh boy. Part three, they're gay. <laughs> and now it's time for the part of the video where we read letterboxed reviews of mostly Portuguese people very hurt and upset that Marnie and Anna aren't gay. I thought they, but they, I spent the whole movie waiting for them, but they, I only have two neurons and they collapsed. Queerbait is okay if it entertains me. This queerbait didn't entertain me. But what the hell, I spent the whole film shipping Marnie and Anna for at the end, I should give zero stars, I'm feeling damned that drug, I will never be happy. Studio Ghibli, I hate you, you made me think that a granddaughter and a grandma were a lesbian couple. This movie's super gay and nobody warned me. I wanna punch Anna so bad. <laughs> Top 10 anime betrayals. Why were we all so sure they were lesbians? Let's break it down. I really do think it runs deeper than how Marnie and Anna are constantly falling over themselves to confess their love for each other. Just know that I love you. I love you more than any girl I've ever known. Oh, Marnie. 
I love you so very much. Anna, I love you. There are a few specific things that make this movie feel so fucking queer. Marnie cannot stop calling Anna her little, special, darling, precious secret. You're my precious secret. That you're my precious secret. And I love that you're my secret. And don't tell anyone our precious secret. This triggers in our minds the cliche of queerness concealed out of necessity. Different kinds of queerness have been depicted as taboo and secret and dirty and exciting in media for a very long time, for better and for worse, for mostly worse. Worse. On top of this, I would wager that the magical and cosmic elements of this story represent romantic attraction. Hear me out. Marnie somehow knows Anna's name before she ever meets her, and she says she's been watching her. It's like she's had her in her heart this whole time, and she's just been waiting to meet her. The first thing that Anna says to Marnie is literally, I saw you in a dream. If parties ever happen again, next time you're at a party, walk up to someone that's beautiful in your age and look at them and say, I saw you in a dream. Then come back to this video and comment whether the energy after that was really like chill and platonic. In my dreams, I saw a girl just like you. It's not a dream. The two kids are immediately obsessed with each other as soon as they meet, without much in common in regards to temperament or interests or personality. When you meet someone and there's an immediate mutual attraction without practically any reason for there to be, it's often because you want to kiss each other on the lips. You don't have to have a reason to fall in love. Look at me. That shit just occurs. Now, Marnie and Anna are 12, so they develop a physical intimate relationship as well, but one appropriate to their age. Kissing at the age of 12 sure happens, but most of the time it's an aspirational symbolic function to them. Makes them feel like big boys. Instead, they engage in age appropriate flirting. They whisper secrets to each other and they play and they confess their love and they touch a lot and they get into mischief. They do dangerous and fun things without adults knowing. Marna's smirking at Anna throughout the whole thing and Anna's fucking blushing. Look at this top energy. It's, it's not done. And I trust that I don't have to say a damn thing about the scene where Marnie cradles Anna from behind and teaches her how to row. Come sit with me. You're doing fine. That's like housewife cheating on her husband with a golf coach level obvious. At the ball, when Marnie dances with the boy instead of Anna, Anna looks like this. And once more, of course, I must point out the turtleneck. Look at it, looks too good to be straight. So what's going on here? What are, what are we doing? Am I, am I just sitting here and pointing out all the stuff that could be construed as gay to cathartically release the sexual tension that was building in my heart for the whole movie? Yeah, of course. Do I have a greater point? No. But I still feel weird, so I'm gonna keep talking until that feeling goes away. Part 4. Stories que não existem. As the film goes on, Marnie and Anna seem to phase out of each other's reality more and more. Marnie starts to mistake Anna for a boy and says someone else's name to her that Anna doesn't understand. Kazuhiko? What are you talking about? It's me, Anna. What's going on? Anna. Anna! This suggests that in the time that Marnie and Anna spend together on their magical nights out, Anna's actually body swapping with a man that Marnie would one day marry. Unfortunately, this is her grandfather. Now this actually confirms for real that Marnie and Anna were experiencing a romance. Makes it weird, but it confirms it. And if we're taking in the whole movie, of course, none of us are okay with Anna dating her grandmother. So does the queer movie in my brain even exist? Portuguese letterbox reviewers are surely vexed. I'd be remiss not to mention that the movie is also based on a novel, so they're being faithful to the source text. I don't know if I could call this queer baiting. It's, it's not as cynical as queer baiting. How can we say that this isn't a queer movie when practically everyone that views it is inside of a queer movie until the grandma time travel info dump at the end? It exists in our collective imagination. Surely this counts for something. Okay, now this is the interactive part of the video. I need you to do some, okay? So think of a chorus that you know very well, like of a song that you know, think of a chorus from it that you know really well. Pick the first one that you think that you think you can really remember with a lot of detail. And then on the count of three, we're gonna close our eyes and we're gonna like listen to the song. Like just remember how it sounds and try to pick out as much deal as you, you, detail as you can. So pick a song, I've just picked the song. And now on one, two, three, we're gonna listen to it. Ready? One, two, three. Are we listening to music right now? What was that? Is anything real? I think in a strange fashion, the queer reading of when Marnie was there exists in the same space as that song we just listened to. It's factual that experiencing intimate, exciting love from another woman is the first thing that sets Anna on a journey of feeling seen and opening up. The overblown emotion and the final scene together defines romance. Of course I forgive you, Marnie. I love you. That's the first heartbreak of your life right there. That's how it looks. So I'm advocating for our right to take the queer reading out of this movie 
as a whole thing and have it even though the whole movie also exists. Universes within universes. All of them valid. There really is something to retaining your power to engage with media in this three-dimensional fashion. Devoid of a number rating. Presume there is something to learn from this piece of art. Seek it out. Surely this is a more productive way to consume art that you have reservations with, particularly for people who want to create things of their own. And it annoys me less than arguing whether or not the movie's gay. Okay. B part five. Enough of this gay shit. Let's get back to the mental illness. What, for lack of a better word, cures depression? How do you get back into society after being in a pit? Between the five connections that Anna makes in the movie, this is how I talk. I happen to believe that I have something of an answer with the five relationships that Anna develops in the movie, all of them representing a different aspect of a thing that someone mentally ill needs to make a kind of recovery. That's right, we are in the list within list, universes within universes. Your universe is a YouTube video that you're watching right now and I am God of this universe. One, Marnie, or embracing your queerness. Now you might be watching this video and you might be straight and if so, shame on you. But even you have been changed by love at some point in your life. You know what your friends say when you tell them that you're in love? They say congratulations. Romance is widely accepted to be one of the most beautiful things that we have in our reality. If you're aromantic watching this, um, uh, Red Dead Redemption 2 is the best thing that we have in this reality. Or maybe like Code Geass. Do you think that Lelouch was aromantic? Or was he just like so focused that he, well, I just, I just ship him with C2, I just still do. Shit, I got really off topic. Marnie represents functionally in the depression reading of this movie, any piece of yourself that other people can't understand that needs something miraculous to reveal it. The cleanest way is to interpret this as queerness, but any piece of you that is you that needs to be seen that isn't gonna be actively, naturally cultivated by your environment is a part of yourself that you're gonna have to speak into being. And if you never have that first little spot of knowing yourself, then you're never gonna be able to do that. Finding someone or something special that makes a part of you that no one else understands seen for the first time, that's part of growing up. Two, Tochi, embracing your darkness. Anna is assaulted by pure positivity by everyone in her life, but when it comes down to she's finally in the town and has some free time, she sees the kids playing, and then she sees this sad boatsman, and she goes to him. This is big, she's willingly spending time with a person. Hey mom. Sorry, I'm in the middle of filming something, but I really need- I'm blanking on a word. Okay. Tochi is silent and ostensibly a sad person, and this connects with Anna. She's drawn towards it. She feels comfortable around it. It's demonstrating the sadness that Anna feels to its maturation. Tochi has a job. <laughs> Does he? Does Tochi have a job? He just rows around. But he's an adult with a place in society and a life. I think this helps Anna visualize a potential future for her, even if she doesn't change, which I don't know if she did have at the beginning of the movie. Hisako, learning to embrace your passions. The next person, the next person that Anna bonds with is a painter who connects with Anna based on her creativity and interests. Unlike most of the adults in Anna's life, Hisako shares the same drive as Anna. They're both hyper fixated on this mansion and they both love to draw. She's an adult that represents and validates again to maturation these things that Anna actually does give a shit about. So her kindness, unlike the kindness of everybody else, holds more power, holds more context and meaning in her life. Sayaka, embracing your responsibility. This is Anna's only non-lesbian child, real human being friend. This girl is not like Anna. She's abrasive, she's bold, she has a lot of questions, but vitally, because of these qualities, she demands Anna's help. See, this little girl lives in the mansion that Marnie used to live in and she's found Marnie's diary and she needs to know who this person was. They're the only two people who even know Marnie existed, so Sayaka demands that she help her find her. A lesser known method of learning is teaching. Ask any parent if they knew that they had the capacity to raise a baby before that lawless little infant goblin was in their home. People discover capacity and fortitude that they didn't know they had dormant in their souls when they are forced to be responsible for a person who desperately needs them. Anna gains a responsibility by looking out for her little friend. A sense of responsibility that is the same thing that would also incur you to, you know, like be nice to people who are nice to you. And finally, Nobuku, the girl in the town that Anna lashed out at in the fat phobic gay orphan attack of 2014. Right at the end of the movie, as Anna's leaving town, she finds her and she stops and she apologizes for what she said. And I love that Nobuku does not accept your apology, bitch. I'm sorry about the other day. 
Next year, you better join us for trash pickup. She gave her so much grace for so long, and we hear from her mother early in the film that she sobbed like the whole day after she got called fat by her. But we were talking about Nobuko here, and she is a woman of grace and beauty, and she is not a spiteful person. So what she offers in lieu of forgiveness is a conditional acceptance of the apology. Forgiveness not included, potentially on the horizon, not included, not it's okay. If someone ever hurts you and instead of apologizing, they explain that it's because of their mental illness, that's bullshit. I've properly destroyed my life before because of my borderline personality disorder, but it was still me doing it. I have a reason, it's not an excuse. You have to work to make this right. Your brain, the harm you caused, and your future. In conclusion, they're gay. That's the end of the video. I think I'm an addict, want the world and I'm a habit. I'm so fucking dramatic, got all my bones up in the attic and I dance them all around like a marionette. As per usual, we get the full makeup look at the end of the video.